Tim Tebow's career was one of the most polarizing in sports history. As just a high schooler, he was hailed the chosen one. By the end of his college career, he was considered one of the greatest players in college football history. Once he got to the NFL, he became America's golden boy. However, what followed was a downfall of epic proportions. Tim Tebow was born in the Philippines while his parents were there on missionary work. When he was three years old, the Tebows moved back to the States and settled down in Jacksonville, Florida. Tim, along with all his other siblings, was homeschooled, but this didn't stop him from playing football. His freshman year, he played tight end at Trinity Christian Academy. However, Tebow knew he was meant to be a quarterback. So in his sophomore year, he transferred to Nice High School, where he would get a chance to play QB. Nice had the worst football team in the county, but when Tebow arrived, he completely changed the team. His junior year, he and the team started making national headlines. But unfortunately, Tim's season was cut short due to injury. In a game where Nice was losing by 17, Tebow came up limping after taking a sack. When he went to the sideline, he told his coaches he wasn't coming out of the game. And they were like, yeah, that's fine, because they thought it was just a really bad cramp. But as he kept playing, his limp became more and more severe. Tebow didn't let this stop him though, as he ran for a 29-yard touchdown that tied the game. After, Tebow said he could hear the bones moving in his leg as he ran. An x-ray later revealed he had played the entire second half with a broken fibula. Even though he missed the rest of the season, this warrior mentality made college coaches fall in love with him. During Tebow's senior season, he became a legend. He was a five-star recruit and ranked as the number one quarterback in the nation. Head coaches from some of the best college teams in the country, like Florida and Alabama, would come watch his games in person. That year, Tebow was named Florida's Mr. Football and led Nice High School all the way to a state championship. During his senior year, he was such a big star that ESPN aired an hour-long documentary on him titled Tim Tebow, The Chosen One. The Chosen One had a big choice to make too. After receiving offers from virtually every college program, Tim had to decide which one to commit to. After narrowing his choices down to Florida and Alabama, Tebow announced he would be playing for his parents' alma mater, the University of Florida. His freshman year, Tim was the Gators' backup QB, but still made an impact. Head coach Urban Meyer used Tebow as a Wildcat quarterback, and on his first ever college play, he scrambled into the end zone for a touchdown. As the season went on, Tim got more and more snaps. In the national championship game, the freshman made a big impact, throwing one touchdown and rushing for another. Heading into 2007, Tim was named Florida's starting QB, but no one could have predicted what would happen next. Despite questions surrounding his passing ability, Tebow passed for 300 yards and three touchdowns in his first collegiate start. As the season progressed, Tim became a Heisman hopeful, but he truly lost locked up the award in a November game versus South Carolina. In that one, Tebow had 400 yards from scrimmage and scored seven, yes, seven total touchdowns. On and off the field, Tim was like two totally different people. Off it, he was this extremely humble, soft-spoken guy. But on it, he was a beast, trucking defenders, screaming, yelling, and delivering some pretty intense pregame speeches. But no matter where he was, whether that be on the field or on campus, Tebow was a superstar. Everyone in Gainesville was absolutely in love with this guy. At the end of the 2007 season, Tebow became the first sophomore ever to win the Heisman Trophy after passing for 3,200 yards, 32 touchdowns, and six interceptions, while rushing for 895 yards and 23 additional scores. That means the quarterback scored a total of 55 touchdowns that year, which broke the record for the most in SEC history. Entering the 2008 season, there was a ton of hype surrounding the Gators. Some even believed they would go undefeated. In the first three games of the season, Florida won in blowout fashion. But then, the game versus Ole Miss happened. With less than two minutes to play, the Gators were down 31-30. But then, on fourth and short, Tebow got stuffed behind the line to gain, which sealed the victory for the unranked Rebels. After this shocking loss, Tebow delivered the promise speech. I'm extremely sorry, but I promise you one thing, a lot of good will come out of this. You have never seen any player 
in the entire country play as hard as I will play the rest of the season and you never see someone push the rest of the team as hard as I will push everybody the rest of the season and you never see a team play harder than we will the rest of the season. God bless. This speech rallied the team, and they didn't lose another game for the rest of the season. The Gators didn't just win every game, though. They absolutely dominated. They beat number three LSU 51-21. Two weeks later, they handed number eight Georgia a 49-10 loss. Then they demolished number 24 South Carolina 56-6. In the SEC Championship, a game they needed to win to make the national championship, Florida took down number one Alabama 31-20. In the first half of the national championship game, the Gators offense struggled. Hey, let's, let's go, get in here! Let's get go. in here right now! Get in here! Let's, 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 let's go! We got 30 go. minutes! Let's go! For the rest of our lives! For the rest of our lives! Let's go! In the second half, they came to life and won the game 24-14. Tebow received the most first place votes for the Heisman in 2008. However, he came in third place for the award behind winner Sam Bradford and runner-up Colt McCoy. Tim returned to Florida for his senior season despite being draft eligible. Heading into the SEC championship game that year, the Gators were undefeated and looked like they would be heading back to the national championship. However, Alabama shocked the world and beat them 32-13. Despite not making it back to the natty, Tim shined in the Sugar Bowl, his final collegiate game, completing 88% of his passes for over 500 yards from scrimmage and four total touchdowns. After this game, Tim declared for the 20 2010 NFL Draft. And this is where the controversies began. Tim was a polarizing prospect. He was the golden boy of not just the football world, but also the entire country. Still, experts were split about his NFL future. Tony Dungy said he would pick Tebow with a top 10 pick over any other quarterback in the class. John Gruden said he was the strongest human that's ever played the position and could revolutionize the game. But on the other hand, draft expert Mel Kuyper Jr. said Tim wasn't good enough to be a quarterback in the NFL and should actually switch his position to running back or tight end. Leading up to the draft, Tebow was projected to be a second round pick. Scouts loved his athleticism, leadership, and competitiveness. But on the other hand, people wondered how well he could read a defense and worried about his poor accuracy, even though he set the all-time SEC record for both passing efficiency and completion percentage. Tim also had a very weird throwing motion. When draft day arrived, the Broncos made a move that stunned some people. They traded back into the first round to draft Tim Tebow 25th overall. Tebow's stardom followed him to the pros. Immediately after being drafted, his jersey became the league's number one seller. Before the season started, Broncos head coach Josh McDaniels said Tebow probably wouldn't start any games as a rookie and would not play till he's ready. So basically, that's what happened. He was starter Kyle Orton's backup, but would get into games as a Wildcat QB. That is until week 15. At this point, Denver was 3-10 and, and head coach Josh McDaniels had been fired. With their season virtually being over, interim head coach Eric Studsville decided to start Tebow. In his first NFL start, he completed 8 of his 16 passes for 138 yards, 2 total touchdowns, and no turnovers. Not a terrible first game for a guy some said couldn't play QB. The following week versus the Texans, the Broncos found themselves down 17-0 at half. But then, we got our first glimpse of Tebow time in the NFL. The QB went on to throw for over 300 yards and lead his team to a comeback victory. In the offseason, John Fox and John Elway were hired as the team's new head coach and GM. This was bad news for Tebow. The coach who believed in him enough to draft him in the first round was no longer there. Fox and Elway had no ties to him. They would probably want to go pick their own quarterback. To start the 2011 season, Tebow was once again named Kyle Orton's backup. However, after the team started the season 1-3, Tebow replaced Orton in the middle of a Week 5 matchup versus the Chargers. Tim nearly led Denver to a comeback victory. Although they fell short, the crowd was still chanting, We want Tebow! We want Tebow! So following that game, Tim was named the Broncos starting quarterback. The next week, Tebow mania absolutely took over. With just under three minutes left in the game, the Broncos were down 15. Tim had played pretty poorly up to this point, missing some wide open wide receivers. But then it was Tebow time. It was comeback time. Yeah, 
Tim led the Broncos to a comeback victory after being down 15 with less than three minutes to go. And the thing is, this just kept happening week after week. Tebow and the offense would be non-existent for the first three quarters of the game. Then in the fourth, they would come to life and somehow pull off the victory. The funny part is Tebow wasn't actually playing well in these games. He just made the big plays at the right time, but I think that made the fans like him even more. In a week nine matchup with the Raiders, Denver was down a touchdown late in the third, but ended up winning the game 38-24. Tebow had over 100 rushing yards and tossed two touchdowns in that one. The following week versus the Chiefs, Tim completed just two of his eight passes for 69 nice yards and a score, but the Broncos still won 17 to 10. The next game was Tebow's first in prime time. On Thursday Night Football against the Jets, the Broncos were down three with just over five minutes remaining. Tim then led the team on a 95-yard game-winning drive that ended with him scrambling into the end zone for a 20-yard score that won the game. Obviously, that play is what made all the headlines the next day and not the fact that he just completed 45% of his passes. But hey, when you're winning games, you're winning games. That's all that matters. The following week, Tim set up the game-tying and game-winning field goal in overtime versus the Chargers. Then, versus the Vikings, he had one of his best games as a passer, completing 66% of his passes for 202 yards and two scores in another last-second win. Tebow Mania had taken over. People were Tebowing everywhere. The Broncos were now on a five game win streak and tied for first place in the AFC West. It just seemed like Tebow couldn't lose. He always somehow made it happen. In week 14, the Broncos yet again found themselves down late very late actually. They were losing 10-0 with two minutes to go. Tebow then threw a touchdown to bring them within three. The Broncos defense did their job on the next possession and got the ball back to the offense with 55 seconds left. Tim got the team down to the Bears 40, which set up a Matt Prater game-tying field goal. So to OT they went, and yeah, you can probably guess what happened next. Tebow and the offense set up the game-winning field goal that gave them sole possession of first place in the AFC West. But just when the Broncos seem to be on top of the world, things came crumbling down. The very next week, the win streak came to an end versus the Patriots. Following that game, Tebow completed just 44% of his passes and turned the ball over four times in a loss versus the Bills. In the final game of the regular season, the Broncos were set to go head-to-head -head with the Chiefs, who had actually signed Kyle Orton after Denver released him earlier that season. The Broncos needed to win this one to lock up their playoff spot, but Orton outplayed Tebow and handed Denver their third consecutive loss. The Broncos' playoff fate was no longer in their hands. They needed a Raiders loss to win the division. Oakland did end up losing, which caused a three-way tie at 8-8 eight eight for first place in the AFC West. Luckily, Denver had the tiebreakers and was crowned the division champs. So the Broncos were now somehow headed to the playoffs after starting the season one and four. In the wildcard round, they were set to host the Steelers, who had won 12 games that year. Everyone knew Pittsburgh was the better team. Tebow started airing the rock out early and often in this one and made some of the best throws of his career. In the third quarter, the Broncos found themselves in unfamiliar territory. They were actually winning. 20 to 6. However, the Steelers mounted a comeback and the game was tied at the end of regulation. On the very first play of overtime, the most iconic play in Tim Tebow's career happened. He threw an 80-yard touchdown pass to Demarius Thomas for the walk-off win. Tim had the best performance of his NFL career in this game. He passed for over 300 yards for the first time and scored a total of three touchdowns. But this high point of Tebow's career ultimately marked the beginning of his decline. The next week in the divisional round, Tim completed just nine of his 26 passes as the Broncos got demolished by the Patriots 45 to 10. Tebow finished his first season as a starter by completing just 46% of his passes, which was the lowest completion percentage in the NFL that year, for 1,700 yards, 12 touchdowns, and six interceptions. On the ground, he ran for 660 yards and six scores. Tim also set an NFL record, 
well, not really the kind you want to set. He became the first quarterback in NFL history to start 10 games and complete less than 50% of his throws. When we look at where his numbers sit in the entire history of the NFL, it gets even uglier, but we're going to dive into that later in this video. Heading into the 2012 season, John Elway said Tebow would be the team's starting QB. However, in March, Denver signed Peyton Manning and traded Tim to the Jets for a fourth and sixth round pick. When he arrived in New York, head coach Rex Ryan said Tebow would be used on special teams and as a wildcat quarterback. However, controversy soon followed. While starter Mark Sanchez struggled, fans were calling on the team to start Tebow, which they never did. Tebow only completed six passes as a Jet and rushed for 102 yards. At the end of the season, the team released him. Entering 2013, one of the only people that believed in Tebow came calling, his old head coach, Josh McDaniels. McDaniels was now the Patriots offensive coordinator, and Tim signed with the team right before the start of minicamp. Tebow played in New England's first two preseason games, but completed just 36% of his passes. Before the start of the regular season, he was cut. After being out of the league for a year, the Eagles signed the QB to compete for the third string spot in training camp. Tim played in all four preseason games, but was yet again released before the start of the regular season. No NFL teams came calling after this, so Tim started working as a broadcaster. However, in 2016, he announced he would be pursuing a career in pro baseball, despite not having played the sport since his junior year of high school over 10 years ago. After holding an open tryout, the Mets signed him to a minor league contract. In 2018, he made it all the way to double A, which is two leagues below the pros. He actually put up decent numbers, which is kind of crazy because in my opinion, baseball is one of the hardest sports to play. I know a lot of people made fun of him for trying to go pro in the sport, but he had a 273 batting average in double A. I feel like that's pretty solid. In 2019, he was playing with the Mets triple A team, which is just one league below the MLB. He didn't play as well there, but did hit three home runs in a six game stretch. Things took another unexpected turn in 2021. Tebow announced his retirement from baseball and then got in contact with his former college coach, Urban Meyer, who was now the head coach of the Jaguars. Tim asked Meyer if he could try out for the team as a tight end. He agreed and then signed the former QB. At this point, Tebow was 34 and hadn't played football in six years. Many felt that Jacksonville signing him was a gimmick, and to be totally honest, he probably wouldn't have been signed if Urban Meyer wasn't the head coach. Tebow mania was still a thing though. Before he even played a down for the team, his jersey became the league's top seller yet again. When Tim finally did step on the field, things didn't go well at all. He looked so bad in the team's first preseason game, they cut him right after. That marked the last time we saw him on the football field. So how bad was Tim Tebow actually? Well, uh, historically bad. Since 2000, the only player to have a lower completion percentage than Tebow in a season is Achilles Smith. Even Jamarcus Russell had a higher completion percentage than Tim. Tebow is unfortunately one of the least accurate quarterbacks in NFL history. In two of the 11 games he started in 2011, he completed less than 28. 28% of his passes. To this day, Tim is the only quarterback since 2000 to have two games in a season with a completion percentage below 28. The last player to achieve this ugly feat before Tebow was actually Ryan Leaf who is often considered the biggest bust in NFL history. So how did this quarterback, who was one of the greatest players in the history of college football, struggle so mightily in the NFL? Well, the NFL game is just so much faster than the college one. Tim was never great at making the right reads, but he was able to get away with it in college because the game was slower and he had elite wide receivers around him like Percy Harvin. His throwing motion was not just awkward, but also slow. And in the NFL, every millisecond counts. 
He wasn't getting the ball out fast enough, and even when he did, it usually wasn't an accurate pass. Yes, he had some success running the ball in the pros, but it was much harder for him. NFL defenders are way bigger and so much stronger than college defenders. I think Tim could have had a much longer career if he leaned into what we see Taysom Hill doing today. When Hill comes into a game, he's doing anything from passing to running and even catching the ball. Tebow just didn't have the skills to be an NFL QB. I don't think even the best team with the best offensive scheme, the best offensive players, and the best coaches could develop him into one. So yeah, Tim was not a great NFL player, but he is a great guy. He does tons of charity work. I mean, he literally built a hospital in the Philippines that does orthopedic surgery on children for free that were born with deformities. He also goes on mission trips where he visits orphanages and shares his Christian beliefs. I mentioned Ryan Leaf, the biggest bust in NFL history earlier in this video. If you want to know how he went from almost being drafted before Peyton Manning to behind bars, you can check out this video up here. It's a crazy story with a ton of twists and you probably can't guess how the story ends. 